Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation podcast, a place to learn about the latest ideas from the thought leaders in the area of health, food, the science of mind body interactions, and the environment. Today, I have the great pleasure to speak to Dr. Pedro Bastos, a world renowned Portuguese nutritionist and researcher affiliated with Lund University in Sweden and the European University of Madrid in Spain. He co-founded CN, a Spanish institution providing advanced education in nutritional sciences for health professionals. Dr. Bastos lectures globally on nutrition, lifestyle, and health in four languages and has co-authored several scientific papers in the high-profile journals, including Nature Medicine and Nature Reviews in Cardiology. I was particularly excited about one of his older papers published in Research Reports and Clinical Cardiology entitled The Western Diet and Lifestyle and Diseases of Civilization. Welcome to the show, Pedro. Pedro, it's a, it's a pleasure talking to you today. And I think, um, you know, we can jump right into the, uh, into the meat of our conversation. I, I haven't been... I mean, I couldn't wait for having this opportunity after I've seen you speak at several conferences in in in, in Brazil, um, and so I'm I'm really delighted to be able to today to actually talk to you in in person about some of these uh, topics of common interest. And um, so, yeah, let me let me start with something. Uh, you have you have different interests spanning over your. Um, the time course of your career how how did you first get interested in uh, nutrition so uh, first of all thank you very much for the opportunity to me it's a real pleasure and a real honor to be here with you so thank you very much and uh, thank you also for your kind words uh, so i actually uh, didn't come from a, a health and science uh, background so my first degree was a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration and Economics. And I actually worked for about 10 years for the Portuguese state. So I was in, in public office for almost 10 years. And I, and I, I did work related to economy. Um, nevertheless, I've always been fascinated with science. I've always been fascinated with, uh, with health, the human body, and... Um, with ways to optimize our health and optimize uh, our our body, let, let's say it like this. So because of that, and, and, and to cut a long story short, what I actually did was while I was working there, I decided to go back uh, to college. And so I, I got a degree in, uh, in nutrition. I, I did a bachelor's degree in nutrition, then a master's degree in nutrition. And then I I pursue doctoral studies also in, in nutrition. So the, uh, I, I decided to do that because I, I was really interested in uh, ways to optimize health. And um, at the time, I started to read uh, all that I could find. Of course, I was reading popular books. I didn't have the necessary background to understand a more advanced uh, reading on the subject. And those books really inspired me to uh, pursue studies in nutrition because I got to see uh, that um, what you eat can uh, have a much bigger impact on your health than uh, what I thought uh, it really happened. So I thought that diet could uh, affect mostly uh, your body composition. Uh, at the time, I, I was a very active uh, young man. I exercised, so of course I knew that diet affected body composition and also performance. But by reading various books, I got to the conclusion that uh, diet had a much broader effect on our health and our physiology than I previously thought. So that's how I got to become very interested in nutrition, and that's why I decided to pursue um, a career in this field. So nutrition is obviously one um, com a major component in the um, in the lifestyle changes that that humans, particularly in um, developed countries, have have experienced over the last 
I mean, I would say accelerate in, in an accelerated fashion last 75 years, but really going back further. And, but from reading some of your, you know, outstanding uh, review articles, it becomes obvious that diet is not the only one. I mean, there's many lifestyle changes that are underlying will be experienced, experienced now as a an epidemic of of chronic non-communicable diseases. It's not taken. It's it's not viewed so much as an epidemic and not as life threatening as the recent pandemic, the COVID nineteen pandemic. But but the numbers and the death rates and the impact on society, uh, in terms of you know billions of, of of dollars are 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 much larger. And so my feeling is always is because. Modern medicine, I mean, we're, we're throwing billions of dollars against this epidemic and keep people from dying. Um, but, but nevertheless, the epidemic continues. It's it's a it's a it's a silent epidemic. And um, so, if you want to start with this, why do we have this epidemic, and how what what do we compare it? What baseline do we compare it to? You've done some really interesting analyses of traditional lifestyles and in of indigenous people all around the world, um, which I think provides some of the best evidence really for how far we have deviated from 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 sort of the from sort of the patterns that as humans we we are adapted to genetically. So maybe you you want to comment on on on, on this point. What is this traditional lifestyle, and what are the commonalities? Uh, that make it different from what we what we're doing today, both not just diet but lifestyle wise in general. So I I think as you perfectly expressed that we are indeed facing an epidemic of chronic degenerative diseases, and uh, although this will not be the focus of our talk, uh, but I think that now uh, it's safe to say that uh, we have. Uh, good evidence that uh, a lifestyle and uh, uh, health that, of course, could be attributed to lifestyle changes uh, can also be uh, a risk factor for severe COVID-19. So this means that uh, this epidemic of chronic degenerative diseases has also had an, a major effect on the outcomes of uh, the previous uh, infectious uh, epidemic that we had of COVID-19. So uh, I think the two are related. And um, and now we have good evidence uh, to support this. For instance, we know that people with obesity have a uh, much higher risk of severe COVID-19 than, than, pe than people who are not, who do not have obesity. And then we also have multiple diseases that we know from the start of the of the pandemic that they increase the risk of severe COVID-19. So we indeed have this uh, epidemic of chronic degenerative disease. We are talking about the metabolic syndrome. We are talking about type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, various types of cancer, autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative disease, psychiatric disease, osteoporosis, and uh, various others. And these collectively represent the major causes of deaths in most countries, especially in industrialized countries, such as the ones where we live. Currently, you live in the US, I live in Portugal, and, uh, and it's the same uh, in the US and in Portugal. These are the major killers uh, of our time. And uh, I think that... Um, the reason why we uh, reach this uh, current um, problem is not one one reason. It uh, we are talking about um, various reasons, and uh, but most of them, if not all, are related to lifestyle changes. So, um, without touching upon diet, we can do that later on during our our conversation. I would say that, uh, first of all, we have an epidemic of physical inactivity, and there is uh, a lot of evidence showing that uh, physical inactivity can have major uh, adverse effects. And uh, in fact, physical inactivity has been linked to at least 35 conditions, uh, including the, the major uh, causes of death. Uh, so physical inactivity would be one. 
for uh, that would be the first second we have psychological stress i think that uh, there are lots of um, studies that associate the chronic exposure to stress to multiple health outcomes so i think that nowadays this uh, common myth that uh, what happens in the mind uh, stays in the mind it's or it's not true at all as you know very well you've written extensively on this so what happens in the in the mind what happens in the brain will affect the the other the other organs and systems and and vice versa so i think that psychological stress is also a major problem it, it 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 has been of course mentioned many times but i, I don't think that we've uh, addressed this properly that's my view uh, of course i'm not an expert on this but uh, my view is that this has not been properly addressed and it's uh, we we don't um, we don't give it uh, his due um his, his due effect so i think that uh, we should uh, consider this much more than we do. Then we have also um, inadequate sleep patterns and uh, circadian disruption. There are various studies, including human experiments under controlled conditions, showing that uh, reducing the number of hours of sleep or decreasing uh, sleep quality or inducing circadian disruption can lead to various metabolic changes such as insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, an increase in blood pressure, an increase in inflammatory markers, and so on and so forth. So I think that inadequate sleep patterns and circadian disruptions, which is something that we find, for instance, um, in uh, shift workers, but also many people do that during the weekends. They have the so-called social jet lag because they go out and they they go to sleep at and a typical um, time schedule, which is completely different than the time schedule that they use during the week. So uh, this is another uh, factor that I think can contribute to uh, this epidemic of chronic degenerative disease. Then we have pollution, we have smoking, we have, uh, of course, uh, various dietary factors, and we also have... Uh, derived from uh, an inadequate diet and also physical inactivity, a positive uh, caloric balance. And, uh, and I think that the positive energy balance uh, is also a contributor to various chronic degenerative diseases. And uh, of course, we should focus on uh, food quality, but we, can, we cannot dissociate food quality from the quantity and from energy intake and energy balance. And uh, so I, I think that energy balance is also a big issue. And then we could uh, go on and then perhaps uh, discuss the fact that nowadays we, we have uh, an inadequate use of antibiotics, which can uh, mess with our microbiome, with our microbiome. And also we are not exposed as we were during most of our evolutionary history to the various microbes that are present uh, in the soil, in the, the various plants with which we interacted. We do not interact with those anymore, with animals and also with other humans. So uh, nowadays, uh, I think that, uh, and, I, and I'm saying this because I've read studies on uh, this uh, subject. I'm not an expert and I've not done any research on this, but from what I've read uh, from the scientific literature, my, uh, my take away from this is that uh, having um, a more rich and diverse microbiome, especially in the gut, is associated with various positive health outcomes. But in order to do that, you need to change your diet and you need to change also your lifestyle because this is not just about diet, it's also about lifestyle. And uh, the reason why, in my view, uh, various researchers have found that traditional populations have a more rich and diverse microbiome is not only because the diets of these traditional populations is completely different than the, the typical Western diet, but also because these individuals are exposed to the various microbes that exist in their environment. Of course, this can pose risks. I'm not saying that 
that doesn't occur. Of course, infectious uh, infections were and still are the biggest cause of, of mortality in various traditional um, pre-industrial populations that, that do not have access to what we have in our modern world. Nevertheless, this uh, absence of microbial exposure can also have an impact, uh, especially on our immune system, and this can then have an impact on the risk of various uh, uh, chronic degenerative diseases, mainly because it can affect inflammation regulation. And if you have, a, um, if you have a, let's say it like this, a deficiency in the regulation of inflammation, you can have a more inflammatory phenotype. And we know now from various lines of evidence that uh, low-grade chronic inflammation is a major driver of most, if not all, of these diseases and conditions that I mentioned. So I, I think that the, um, the reason why we are as we are right now is multifactorial. First, because we've deviated a lot from uh, from what our uh, evolutionary determined physiology is adapted to because we've changed our environments, we change our lifestyle, and also because now we have the ability to keep, and I know that this sounds awful, and, and I'm glad that we have this now. Nevertheless, we cannot forget that we have the ability to keep sick people alive for a long time. And this is very good. I'm glad that we have that because many of my close friends and friends, unfortunately, they are not healthy. So I'm very glad for this, and I'm glad... For that we have this, nevertheless, um, and, and because I'm a, a humanitarian at heart, that's my first principle. So I'm very glad that we can keep uh, people alive even when they have a certain disease. Nevertheless, this can also affect uh, evolution because we are uh, taking out um, negative selective pressures. So mm -hmm. we do not have the pressures that would make us adapt to these uh, faulty, let's say it like this, diet and lifestyle. So because of this, we will continue, in my view, to have this mismatch between our evolutionary determined and virtually unchanged physiology and our modern world. Yeah, so this, I mean, it's a lot of information. Some, somehow, you know, the, the listener may get the impression we're, we're actually doomed with all these things happening. And... And I mean, there's no question that whatever you said, these influences are happening. It's not some intellectual, you know, thing that scientists write about, but this is all happening. It's not going to slow down, I think, um, in, in the foreseeable future. Medicine will work harder and harder to, as you said, eliminate this uh, selection pressure. So uh, we don't have a good chance of of adapting um you know, to these to these new to these new challenges. But it's interesting. We talked about the microbiome. So the microbiome actually has the ability to rapidly adapt. Um, you know, the hundred thousand, hundred thousand or more genes, as opposed to our, you know, twenty two thousand genes. So they have this ability, and it's been shown to rapidly adapt to a new diet within twenty four forty eight hours or. <clears throat> So there's this other mismatch between our microbes that have adapted to this new reality, to this new lifestyle, and our our human genes that have not and will not have a great chance of of doing this in the even in the next ten thousand years, I would say. You know, so <clears throat> um, I often think about this. We, you know, we blame a lot on the on the on the altered microbiome of, of our diseases, but in reality. The microbiome, the microbiome has done its its work to adapt to the environment. It's just that we can't catch up with that. So I mean, I find that an, this concept of mismatch between our genes and the environment and the microbes, I think, is really at the core of um, of of this health problem. And um, um, you also mentioned I want to talk a little bit more about this about this concept of um, of low-grade systemic inflammation, which seems to be, which seems to be related to all these diseases that we talked about and all these phenomena. 
do you want to say a few more words about this? I mean, how can we reliably measure this? So it's not measured if you go to my primary care physician, he's not going to tell me you have systemic low-grade inflammation. They can tell you if you have an acute infection, but not... Um, so how, but then on the other hand, there's a lot of functional medicine practitioners who have all kinds of measures that they recommend, you know, where we can assess this. Are there good objective reproducible ways of assessing this low grade immune activation in our bodies? I think that unfortunately, from a clinical perspective, is not very easy. Of course, we can measure high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Uh, high sensitivity it just simply means that uh, the, um, the the test used has the ability to de to detect very low values uh, of this um, inflammatory marker, which is a protein in our blood, typically is measured in the serum or plasma. Uh, so high sensitivity C reactive protein could be a biomarker that we could use in clinical practice. And in fact, it has been used a lot in various epidemiological and also in randomized controlled trials in order to assess the effect of a, a drug or a lifestyle or dietary intervention on inflammation. Nevertheless, it, it is not completely reliable because we can have uh, several factors that can affect uh, C-reactive protein. Nevertheless, if we measure uh, C-reactive protein using a high sensitivity test um, various times, so using multiple measures, I think it could be more reliable. So that could be uh, an option. It's not the ideal one. The ideal one would be to measure a panel of various inflammatory proteins, but that's not feasible. It's not cost effective, uh, especially in clinical practice. You can do that in, in research, especially if you belong to a research group that has access to, <laughs> to uh, millionary grants, as I call them. But uh, when you don't, it's not easy. For instance, in our group, we've measured uh, high sensitivity to reactive protein and because that's the, the cheapest and the easiest one to use. And also because the group uh, that I belong to is very interested in using uh, biomarkers <laughs> or interventions that can be uh, applied by uh, primary primary doctors. So family doctors, for instance, uh, I, I, I work uh, with the, the Center for Primary Health Care Research that belongs to the, it's incorporated at Lund University in Sweden, and they are very interested in what can uh, be done for patients that have this or that disease, but could be used in clinical practice. So that's why uh, we use the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Um, so that could be an option. We have other uh, biomarkers that can also be associated with inflammation, such as ferritin, such as uric acid, fibrinogen, but there are other factors that can also affect uh, these biomarkers, so they are not uh, as reliable as C-reactive protein, which, again, it's not the, the, the ideal way, but that could be my option uh, for <laughs> clinicians. It's sort of surprising that something that is, has such a, um, a major impact on, on our biggest health problem, you know, that, that medicine or science has not come up with, with an easy way to measure this as a routine exam when you go to your to, to your annual uh, annual exam, you know, to your primary care physician. Um, do you think that um, so? There's a lot of people out there and on the social media that uh, promote you know these various tests and then also promote uh, remedies, particular certain uh, supplements. Um, to to sort of you know correct or normalize these parameters, um, I mean, how much of this do you think is 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 actually you know a pseudoscience, and how much of this is actually can can be considered? Uh, I mean, you talk to a lot of audiences. I think that you know that have people that may be less critical um, towards you know it's, it's, uh, like this conversation that we have. I'm I'm sort of you know the the constantly um, suspicious scientist who thinks 
you know, unless it's proven with with evidence, I I won't believe it. I have changed that to a certain degree because there are many things that I think in modern medicine we're just not doing in 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 the in the most appropriate way and not conceptualizing. But um, I mean, do you think there's there's a danger for the average consumer to sort of do all kinds of things and pay pay money and spend money on, which are not really don't really have the evidence behind them. I think there is, of course, uh, there are various supplements, remedies, as you said, that are being promoted as anti-inflammatory uh, when in fact they are not, or they could in fact be an anti-inflammatory. Nevertheless, anti-inflammation anti is not necessarily a good thing because uh, and, and this opens a, a broader discussion on inflammation, I, I think, because I believe that we need to um, make a clear distinction between uh, acute physiological inflammation and chronic pathological inflammation. Because many people assume that because inflammation leads to the, the, the cardinal sides of inflammation that everyone can uh, recognize, everyone is familiar with those because we've all all have suffered uh, an injury like an ankle sprain or or suffered a surgery so we know what happens we know that uh, the the um, the tissue that is affected will uh, become um, hot it would become uh, red swollen and we will have pain and we will have loss of function so because of all of this we've been taught taught that inflammation is a very bad thing that needs to be fighted so we've all used anti-inflammatory uh, interventions such as a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or uh, ice for instance or cryotherapy now nowadays many people are, talk about uh, ice baths and cryotherapy for this and that uh, some even say that it grows hair. I've tried, but unfortunately it didn't work. <laughs> but um, coming back to this, so we think that uh, inflammation is uh, an adverse reaction, when in fact inflammation is uh, a physiological necessary uh, reaction, because uh, when you are uh, faced with... Um, uh, a danger such as a virus, a bacteria, a, a chemical substance, or you suffer an injury, you need to activate uh, inflammatory pathways. Not only because you need, for instance, in the case of uh, an infection, to be able to fight that microbe effectively, and inflammation is part of that uh, fight response that our immune system uses, and also because we know that uh, we need to recruit cells that are involved in inflammation. And by doing so, we will activate the inflammatory response because these cells will be necessary in the case of an injury, for instance, to clean the, the, the tissue, to clean the tissue of uh, the, various, the various debris, cellular debris that will be there. So we need to, when, when you suffer let's use a, a metaphor when you have a, a house and uh, there is a hurricane that destroys a part of your house before you can rebuild it you need to clean and take out the garbage so you need to take out all of the debris and then you can uh, um, rebuild the house so this is more or less what happens when you have an injury you need to clean the the um, the, the 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 side where you had this uh, where you suffered this injury this tissue where you suffered the injury so for that you need immune cells such as macrophages for instance uh, and for that you need to activate and recruit those cells and that will lead to an inflammatory reaction because those cells participate in this they also participate in the fight against the bacteria for instance and nevertheless it, Although this will lead to the various signs of inflammation, which seems like a bad thing, in fact, there will be um, a time during this inflammatory reaction where these cells will, will activate other cells, and this will lead to the, um, the cleaning and the repairing process that is necessary for you to uh, go back to your previous self where your your tissue 
uh, was uh, healthy and uh, and and didn't uh, and wasn't affected by whatever it aff affected the tissue. So in order for you to have uh, tissue repair, tissue repair, you need to activate the inflammatory response. So if you inactivate it, if you inhibit it with anti-inflammatory strategies, you can mess up the repairing process. And also you can mess up the uh, your defense mechanisms against uh, uh, an infection, for instance. So using anti-inflammatory interventions could be a good thing when you have a chronic pathological inflammatory response, but it could mess up normal physiological process when you don't. So I think that we need, uh, first of all, to know if we indeed have um, a pathological or a physiological inflammatory reaction. That's the first thing that we need to consider. And then I think we need to consider what are the main promoters of chronic systemic inflammation, which is the type of inflammation that we should be afraid of because it's the type of inflammation that in various studies has been associated with the, um, the development uh, or the exacerbation of uh, the various chronic de degenerative diseases and conditions that we mentioned before. And so in my view, it's much more important to uh, use uh, interventions that uh, aim at uh, removing the various lifestyle and dietary and nutritional factors and environmental factors such as exposure to pollutants, for instance, that can activate this type of inflammatory response than to simply use um, a, a certain supplement or whatever remedy to fight inflammation, especially if you don't even know if you indeed have, have a chronic inflammatory reaction. What is the best way then to, so we're not going to change our genes. We will we'll have this mismatch. The only thing that we can change is really the lifestyle. You know, we can't change anything on, on, on ourselves, but we can, you know, change, change these various lifestyle factors that we now know play a major role in, in causing this mismatch and this inflammation. And let's, Let's focus on, even though there are all these other factors, let's focus on the diet um, part of it. And um, what would you say is, I mean, you've, in some of your review articles, you know, you made some some statements that I personally would not totally agree with. So, you know, being a, a big fan of the traditional Mediterranean diet, going back to when it was first recorded and then looking into this, how it came about by all these people living around the Mediterranean, um, you know, contributing to this diet over 2000 years. And what, what then came out of it and what shares a lot of commonalities around these Mediterranean countries is something that um, has been tested, you know, for, for a long time in, in terms of the health benefits, very different from the modern versions and in Italy and Spain and probably Portugal that that has really deviated a lot from that original plan. Um, but one thing about these these diets is there was a the whole a, a big proportion of uh, complex carbohydrates. So there was a lot of uh, you know and still is a lot of bread and grains and pasta and um, is 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 that um, was some of the diets that what the, the the diet that you have recommended based on what our hunter gatherers um, ancestors you know were living on was was quite different was there, there was um, so what do you think is and and this is almost like this culture war between you know keto diet and the paleo diet and the the plant based and vegan diets. What, what do you think the evidence falls in, uh, comes in to really guide, um, you know, people that are so desperate to know what they should do? Um, wh where does the science come in and wh what does it really support? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, regarding um, the traditional Mediterranean diet, uh, indeed, as you said, it's very different from the modern versions. I think the modern versions uh, uh, have nothing to do with the traditional Mediterranean diet. And um, in fact, the traditional Mediterranean diet, or at least I would say the Mediterranean diet that uh, led 
to uh, this notion that uh, a Mediterranean diet is the healthiest diet in the world and, and led to the various epidemiological and also randomized controlled trials using a Mediterranean diet is actually traditional diet of Crete. So an island, uh, uh, the biggest island in, 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 uh, in Greece. And the traditional diet of Crete is very different from the, the, the modern versions of the Mediterranean diet. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, trying to follow a uh, more traditional Mediterranean diet is a, a step or a series of steps in the right direction. So uh, to me, that would be a much better diet than the, the typical Western diet that most that many people unfortunately follow. So um, I'm not, let's say it like this, against that at all. So I think that's a, a step in the right direction. Nevertheless, uh, what I I think it's really important in my view is, and I, I think we've deviated a lot from what really matters. That, that's my my personal view from reading the, the, the literature and from being uh, uh, also in, on various stages, uh, on, on various scenarios, because uh, I've had the opportunity, as you said, to, to lecture um, across various countries and continents uh, to very different uh, audiences. So I've had people who are fanatical about uh, plant-based or even a vegan diet. Others were fanatical about uh, an animal-based carnivorous diet or a ketogenic diet, which a carnivorous diet, it's not necessarily a ketogenic diet because in order to be a, a keto diet, you, you need to really increase your intake of fat and you cannot really increase a lot of intake of protein because of, of gluconeogenesis, because the amino acids from protein will be converted into glucose. So it's not necessarily the same. But indeed, you have this, uh, these camps that are uh, that are extreme. It's like the 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 far right, the far left, and the far right in politics. And uh, I'm uh, I should not say this because this is not. Uh, uh, something that's uh, relevant for this, but I, I, I think it's relevant to, to establish a point here regarding nutrition. I'm someone that politically I'm in the center. So and, uh, uh, in terms of nutrition, I'm going to the center also, uh, much more than I did in the past. And um, I stay away from the, the, the polls, so the, from the, um, the, the extremes. And uh, first of all, what is really important? What what can I tell you from from uh, the evidence, and specifically related to inflammation? Because we were talking about chronic uh, inflammation, so we know that uh, nutritional deficiencies are a cause of uh, various uh, perturbations, including also. Uh, inflammation there are multiple mechanisms why it is so but uh, for the sake of our argument let's cut this short and say that uh, uh, deficiencies especially of micronutrients can promote inflammation or contribute to a more inflammatory prone uh, phenotype i'm talking about for instance magnesium zinc selenium and, and various other micronutrients so the first thing that i would say it's important is to make sure that you have an adequate intake and an adequate status of the various micronutrients. So whatever diet you follow, I don't care if it's keto, if it's plant-based, make sure that you are choosing the right foods because in any of these diets, you can choose foods that will not, um, will not give you uh, the right amounts of all of the nutrients. So, and in all of these diets, you can uh, be more selective and uh, and really choose the foods that will optimize your nutritional status. So that would be my first uh, recommendation. The second recommendation is to uh, make sure that you have an adequate intake of omega-3 fatty acids because these... Uh, which are abundant in uh, various uh, types of fish, such as sardines, mackerel, salmon. We know that, uh, first of all, they generate molecules that facilitate a process called inflammation resolution. So it's not anti-inflammatory, 
they facilitate the resolution of inflammation, which is different than anti-inflammation. Because when we talk about inflammation, we need to make sure that uh, an acute physiological inflammatory response can occur. So it has to start, it has to um, be amplified, which is the normal course of an inflammatory response. But then when the goals of inflammation have been met, it should, uh, should cease, it should be extinguished. And in order to do so, you need to activate uh, pro-resolution uh, pathways. And we have mediators that facilitate that process. And some of those mediators, they come from omega-3 fatty acids. So that would be uh, another recommendation. And indeed, we have clinical trials showing that uh, omega-3 fatty acids can reduce inflammatory biomarkers and can even improve the clinical outcomes of certain chronic inflammatory disease, such as, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis. Then we have various phytochemicals, such as polyphenols, that have the ability to directly inhibit inflammatory pathways or neutralize some of the promoters of inflammation, such as reactive oxygen species. So it can dampen oxidative stress. And at the same time, it can regulate, directly regulate the expression of genes that can lead to inflammation. And also, when we talk about these uh, bioactive compounds that we find in various uh, spices, fruits, vegetables, we are talking about increasing, not increasing the intake of these phytochemicals individually as a supplement. You can do that. There are already a few randomized controlled trials supporting that. Nevertheless, I think the, the evidence is not that strong. Uh, because the, the many of these randomized control trials, methodologically speaking, have uh, various flaws and the sample sizes are very small. But what I'm talking about is increasing the sources of these phytochemicals. So I'm talking about uh, vegetables, fruits, spices. And when you do that, you are also increasing the intake of certain micronutrients that can also have an impact on inflammation, since we are talking about inflammation, such as vitamin C, potassium, magnesium, etc. And then you also have the so-called, and you know this much more than I do, you're an expert in, in this, I'm not, the so-called microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So the so-called prebiotics that can contribute to a more diverse and, and rich gut microbiome which can lead to a better, um, a better health phenotype. Let's, uh, let's say it like this. So, so to sum it up, I would say, uh, make sure that you have a proper intake of the various nutrients. Make sure that you have an adequate intake of omega-3 fatty acids. Make sure that you have a, an adequate intake of the sources of various phytochemicals, such as polyphenols, and also these microbiota accessible carbohydrates and make sure that uh, you remove or greatly decrease from your diet certain food component, uh, components that uh, can contribute to oxidative stress, to inflammation and a range of uh, um, disturbances such as, uh, uh, such as uh, high intakes of sugar, refined grains, alcohol, hydrogenated fats, excessive salt, oxidized lipids, and for instance, advanced glycation end products, uh, acrylamide, uh, um, and various other substances that, you, that are formed during high temperature and low humidity food processing or food cooking methods such as frying, for instance. So I would say remove all of that from your diet and make sure that you have a diet that includes the various vitamins, minerals, amino acids, uh, fatty acids, and uh, also phytochemicals and the microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So that would be my main recommendation. And then you can choose whatever flavor of the month's uh, dietary pattern you, you like. Coming back, um, uh, coming back to the to the carbohydrates. So there's uh, the, the carbs have gotten a really bad rap, but I mean carbs are not carbs. So the these max is uh, microbiota accessible carbohydrates are actually something that you want to optimize in your diet because you want to if you feed your microbes and generate a a diverse and rich ecosystem, that's uh, a major insurance against 
chronic inflammation and, and leakiness of your gut. Um, so how, uh, where do you stand there? So I've, I've read in some of your writings that so the, the complex carbohydrates from, from plants and vegetables and fruits are the ones you want to maximize, whereas the ones from, from grains, um, you know, have a high likelihood of, of going in the opposite direction. Is, 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 is that something, I mean, does that, for example, include whole grains or ancient grains, um, I understand where you're coming from. And, and indeed, I think that uh, um, when we talk about grains, indeed, grains have been a part of our diet for uh, thousands of years. Um, they, have, they have not been part of our diet, at least uh, as we eat them today during most of our evolution. So refined grains certainly were not part of our uh, evolutionary past for most of it at least. Um, so uh, I think that, uh, as you said, we need to distinguish between whole grains and refined grains. Nevertheless, when I uh, when I look at the evidence for whole grains, I see that epidemiological studies indeed support whole grains. The, 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 there's no doubt about it. But then when you look at intervention studies that compare whole grains uh, with other foods, you see that uh, the beneficial effects of whole grains, they mostly appear when you compare whole grains with refined grains, for instance, or whole grains with our foods that uh, are not healthy, that healthy. So that makes me a little skeptical. Then, then I'm also a little skeptical about the need to increase whole grains um, uh, uh, significantly because there are many examples of traditional societies that have a minimal intake of whole grains that are very, very healthy. And I can give you a couple of examples. One of them is a, a more modern uh, society, which is Okinawa in uh, southern Japan. And uh, the typical diet of Okinawa, because nowadays we talk a lot about, as you know, blue zones. So parts of the world where you have a larger percentage of centenarians and, and people who are 90 years, old, uh, 90 years old and older. So those are the so-called blue zones. And they are apparently healthy and uh, physically active uh, and, uh, and they still retain their function. So they are not dependent on others. Um, and the, one of those blue zones, uh, I, in my view, it's the one that has been uh, studied more extensively and more thoroughly is Okinawa. And uh, when you look at the traditional diet of Okinawa, it's not the diet of today. It's the diet of 100 years ago, because that's the one that we need to look at. And you, when you look at the diet of 100 years ago of Okinawa, you see that gr grains were a small part of their diet. So the um, the... The, 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 um, the most significant food, the one that contributed the most for their energy intake was sweet potato, mm. which is completely different than whole grains. So because uh, nowadays uh, I see um, some people, um, when they look at uh, these uh, societies, such as Okinawa, they immediately label Okinawa as a, a society that has a high intake of whole grains. And, that, and that's not not necessarily true they have a high intake of plant-based foods that's for sure so they have a plant-based diet but it's not a plant-based diet where whole grains mm. are the majority of those plants so um that's one example there are others i will give you another one that i know much more because my former mentor and, and PhD supervisor who unfortunately passed away a few years ago studied this population he lived in this uh, in this uh, island that I'm going to mention which is an island off the coast of Papua New Guinea so it's an island called Kitava and it's very interesting what he found there because he mainly found an absence or an apparent absence you can never say an absence an apparent absence of obesity overweight type 2 diabetes, and even cardiovascular disease. And also, uh, he, he saw that these people had uh, better um, health biomarkers, such as uh, um, fasting glucose, fasting insulin uh, levels, uh, blood pressure, etc., compared to healthy controls from uh, Western countries. In this case, he used the control population from Sweden. And... This population, 
uh, which is a, it's not a hunter-gatherer population, it's a traditional horticulturalist population. This is a population where carbohydrates represent almost 70% of the energy intake. So this means that this is a population that has a high intake of carbohydrates. Nevertheless, you have an apparent absence of obesity, overweight, and type 2 diabetes, and you have low fasting insulin levels. Because one of the things that many say, especially proponents of a very low carb and low carb diets, is that if you eat a high carb diet, you will immediately get insulin resistance. You will get high fasting insulin. You will have uh, you'll have hyperglycemia, type two diabetes, and all the adverse consequences of this. And this is not true. And there are various examples of this in the literature, but we also have this empirical evidence from populations such as Kitava. But if you look at the staple foods uh, and uh, especially the foods that provide carbohydrates, you don't find uh, uh, grains, especially whole grains, in a higher in a higher quantity in higher quantity. So they do not represent uh, a high percentage of their calories. Mostly, their calories come from tubers. So tubers in fruits are the main sources of. Uh, uh, carbohydrates in their diets. Uh, and this is very similar, uh, we, we, except for the fruits, because in, in Okinawa, they do not have a high intake of fruits. They have high intakes of tubers, especially sweet potato and various other vegetables and roots vegetables also. Uh, but uh, as if you see this uh, population, if you see the population of Okinawa and various others that have been studied across the Pacific, for instance, and in other parts of the world, you see that whole grains were not staple foods in their diet and whole grains were not staple foods during most of our human evolution. Having said that, that doesn't necessarily mean that having a diet that has more whole grains will immediately lead to adverse consequences. And if you compare a diet that has more whole grains with the typical Western diets, much better. So uh, I'm not against that per se. Nevertheless, I would say that I... I would prefer, but perhaps I'm biased, but I would prefer that uh, uh, most of the carbohydrates would come from tubers, fruits, vegetables, and even legumes. It's interesting. So, you know, a long time ago during my uh, early medical school years, I had the opportunity to be in a film expedition to the Yanomami in, in the, on the Orinoco River and similar kind of pattern, similar kind of diet pattern, you know, um, at the time, unfortunately, I was not interested in nutrition, so I didn't pay that much attention, but I read up afterwards, you know, the decades afterwards. And what always surprised us, I mean, how little they, they live in, and or they, they used to live in an overabundance of wild animals, but they didn't really overconsume them. You know, it was a small amount of, of, of animal meat, mainly from fish and birds um, and some monkeys that they ate, but you know, the, I mean, the women were harvesting and foraging all day, all day long in in the in the forests and collecting, you know, tubers and these these kind of um, carbs that that you just mentioned. So I, I think it's probably a consistent pattern if you looked at many of these societies. I, I sort of found it also interesting. I mean, I, I watched last night this first uh, episode of the Blue Zone series on 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 Netflix um, with Dan Putner, You know really well done but also the insights that come out of it is it's um so it's it's not just the diet and it's not it's not only the 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 potatoes it's it's really uh, many factors contributing to this but i would say if if you i i totally agree with you if, if you look at what's the common denominator of these healthy diets i mean there's certain patterns that are evolving and it does appear that that grains are just not not an essential part of it, even whole grains. Yeah, that, that would be my take. Of course, I may be wrong, but that would be my take. And I, I'm not, uh, I'm not um, against in certain conditions, of course, to use uh, against the use of a low carb diet. I mean, um, I've used it myself. Uh, I've seen the evidence in type two diabetic patients, for instance, people with the metabolic syndrome, at least. In the short term, it really provides a benefit. Um, so I'm not against a low carb, a very low carb, a ketogenic diet. There, there, there is, in my view, room for all of that. 
So that's why I I do not follow at this moment in any of these camps. So I do not, I, I'm not in any of them. I think all of these dietary patterns and dietary interventions can have their their uh, their role in uh, for certain individuals and when i try to make a more generalized recommendation which is very hard for me right now it's much harder than it was before because i see that there are individual differences and also because when we look at all of these populations um that are that provide us a glimpse into our evolutionary past when you look at all of them, they are different, of course, because they exploit different environments. You can have, you can find uh, commonalities. You can find common, common uh, um, factors in the uh, in their lifestyle, that for sure. And uh, you've mentioned, we've mentioned a few already. So high physical activity. Uh, exp- they, they live in a, um, in an environment completely different than ours. So they are exposed to various microbes. They are exposed to the sun. Which is also another another issue that we've not touched upon, but uh, sun exposure can also have a, a, a big impact in our physiology. I'm not just talking about vitamin D. I'm not just talking about the adverse consequences such as skin cancer. There are many other effects that uh, uh, exposing ourselves to the sun can have, and these people live uh, in uh, they, they 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 live outdoors most of their days and most of their lives. And uh, that's also part of, of, in my view, of why they perhaps are healthier to a certain extent than we are. And then we have uh, all the other uh, um, factors that are also mentioned in, in these Blue Zones uh, uh, series or documentary, or in this Blue Zones documentary that you are seeing on Netflix. I've also seen it, uh, such as the social um component because many of these uh, populations they live in uh, small villages and here we are talking about blue zones but we could talk about traditional populations so so they live in these small villages they live together so there there's this uh, uh, there are these bonds not only familiar bonds but also this uh, sense of belonging to a group to a tribe and I think that's also important. So the social and psychological um, um, factors they they can also they count. Then uh, the absence or near absence of uh, uh, of 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 exposure of the the near absence of uh, pollution exposure. So the near absence of pollution, that's what I mean. So a very low exposure to pollutants. Unfortunately, nowadays things are changing because we've managed to contaminate the whole world but uh, in the past that was not an issue as it is today um so i think that all of these factors not just diet count and if i if there's something that i can uh, take from all of these studies uh, with traditional populations that uh, many of them i've i've analyzed uh, for review papers or for lectures that i've uh, given I think that uh, what I take from this is that uh, if we really want to optimize our health, we need to tackle physical activity, psychological stress, sun exposure, sleep patterns, circadian rhythms, pollution, smoking, uh, and then, of course, diet and also uh, drugs. I mean, uh, especially pharmaceutical drugs, because uh, these can also have an impact on our health. Some are beneficial, of course, necessary, save lives, and others perhaps are uh, doing more harm than good. So uh, when I say this, I'm not uh, trying to attack uh, the medical establishment. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm trying to say is that if you are going to take a drug, ask your physician, do not take it yourself. Because many people, uh, as you know, take uh, because they can buy them, buy them as an OTC. So it's uh, an over-the-counter um, um, uh, drug. Uh, many people take, for instance, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and this can mess up your microbiota, can increase uh, gut permeability, and can even contribute to low-grade chronic systemic inflammation instead of doing what it's supposed to do, which is to fight uh, an acute, exacerbated um, inflammatory reaction. So I think that uh, if we want to give some advice, uh, I would say 
uh, change your lifestyle and then and then and then after after you've changed your lifestyle and maintain a proper energy balance so uh, positive energy balance is not a good thing especially in the long run so that's another issue yeah, after you tackle all of this then you can start uh, optimizing this and that nutritional or dietary factor and start to follow this or that diet um yeah i i think you know i i would i would fully agree with this i mean let me let me ask you a couple of things we started in the beginning with with my question are we doomed you know are, are we doomed with this mismatch between these rapidly evolving lifestyle changes and our much more conservative traditional genetic makeup um, and the lifestyle changes i mean the lifestyles are not gonna slow down so what we experienced in the last 75 years since the end of world war ii there's, there's no indication that this will slow down certainly with all these modern things coming online with artificial intelligence and you know if you now go into a room with people like the airport or anywhere People don't talk to each other anymore, but they stare into the iPhone. This is all going to get worse. You're going to get implants, so we don't even have to look at a at a at, at a screen. Is this going to? I mean, what is your projection? I know it's hard to to really make any any guesses what will happen in the next seventy five years, but if what's going to happen will happen as fast and exponentially as we've seen the last seventy five years. I mean, where, where are we going to be left with with health? And can we really slow this, not just for a few people that go to meetings where you talk and, uh, you know, live on the east and west coasts of the United States, but in the center of the country uh, and in places where they do not get that information. How How is, how are humans in in developed societies going to deal with this on, on from a health standpoint? Well, I think that we have uh, two options, at least. One option is that uh, lifestyle, I would say lifestyle medicine, uh, start uh, starts to reach the medical establishment and starts to be taught at uh, medical school. So physicians will have in their curricula um, courses on nutrition or physical exercise, on sleep, on circadian optimization, stress, uh, xenobiotic exposure, etc. So that's one. And that could be a way uh, to to fight this back because many people still uh, still go to their primary family doctor in order to obtain uh, information. So I think it's very important that physicians are taught all of the, how to deal with all of this, to, to do a more preventive type of medicine and not just a, type, a reactive medicine, medicine. So when a patient already is has a disease, well, okay, let's deal with it. And that's, that's, very ne that's necessary. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we have that. But we also need prevent, prevention. And I don't think that we are tackling... Uh, prevention as we should so that would be one to um, to to prevent more uh, th that would be the first option the second option is that uh, modern medicine because of artificial intelligence because of technology uh, of the advance of technology will reach a point such as in star trek where you can uh, where the, the physician could immediately detect what uh, problem you had with a scan Whatever problem you had with the scan, whatever deficiency you had with the with the scan, even a nutritional deficiency, and he could immediately correct that with a minimal invasive uh, intervention. So that would be another option, uh, and I I believe that both are not mutually exclusive. So we can move in those two directions, but um, I think that those tech technological advance advancements will uh, they will not uh, i don't think that in my lifetime i will see those so uh, i think that if we really want to do something with the current and uh, the generations that are coming now we need to address the promoters of chronic um, degenerative diseases which are mainly lifestyle factors so that's where we need to go
Okay, I, I think this is a good point to um, close our conversation. It was great, Pedro. Thank you so much for talking to me about this. Um, I, I think there's, there's still a lot of topics that we could continue this, and maybe we'll do it in the in, in the future. Uh, and I'm sure our, our audience will, will enjoy the information that you provided. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much.